Well, good morning and welcome to Jersey Church at Home. We are about ready to walk over into our central venue and get things started. The band has got some great songs lined up this morning. So looking forward to just really a great morning of worship as we sing. Uh, Matt is going to share, if you'll remember last week, our church council, they recommended Matt Reed as our next senior pastor to the church. Matt is preaching in view of that call this morning. And so we are looking forward to hearing from him, just talking with him over the course of this week. He is very excited about the message that God has put on his heart today. And so we are looking forward uh, to spending really time together. So thankful for each and every one of you for joining us online, for all those that are in our central venue right now. And we're just gathered together to worship together. And so we look forward to being able to do that. Well, I'm going to pray for us, and we are going to head into the central venue and start with some music this morning. Father, thank you for today. We thank you for this time of worship. Uh, this is all for you, Father. We pray more than anything that it would be pleasing to you. In Jesus' name, amen. Good morning, everybody. So glad to see you guys. Why don't we all stand up and worship today? Thank 
Continue to surrender our hearts today.
Father, all of our hope and our trust is placed in you, in your heart, in all that you are. Might we continue to surrender our lives to you. Father, we know that you're for us, never against us. We praise you today. Amen. Amen. You all can have a seat this morning. Welcome to Jersey. It is great to be back together with you again this week. Been looking forward to this all week long. If you are new with us today, we just want to extend an especially warm welcome to you and just say thank you. Thank you for spending part of your Sunday morning with us. It really does mean a lot to us to have you here. You know, it has been, we've just been kind of blown away as a church over these last 18, 24 months with, with new people showing up every single week. And so we are so thankful for you. And I just want to say welcome. Hey, handful of things. Uh, actually, one more thing on that. Um, we would love to get to know you a little bit better today. And so if you're online, you can just text us. There's a phone number on your screen. If you're here in the room, we have a welcome area just up by our main entrance. We have people there that would love to meet you have a gift we'd love to give you this morning. And so again, we just wanna say welcome. Handful of things just to mention quickly this morning, lots happening in the life of our church, August, September. And so we just wanna mention a couple of those. First of all, fall groups. Uh, you've heard us talk a little bit about this, but we are kicking off a brand new round of fall groups starting Wednesday night, August 30th. So it's gonna be a great, it's a great list of classes. And so I would encourage you Head out online, jerseychurch.org slash events, look for fall groups, you'll get the whole rundown, and then you can register from there. Moms, dads, grandparents, I also want to mention, Kids Journey is kicking back off on the 30th as well. And so I know that our kids ministry leadership, they are excited about a brand new season of Kids Journey. And so just want to encourage you, make sure you uh, look into that. I will tell you there is a parents' night the week before. And so moms, dads, grandparents, make sure you check that out. A couple other things very quickly, food, fun, and fireworks. It's so hard to believe, but that is just two weeks away. And so we are looking forward to that. Just a great time to spend together as a church family. Uh, really a great opportunity for you to invite somebody just to hang out and have a good time. And so we're gonna be doing that on Saturday night, the 26th. That next morning, we are going to be baptizing several people at the pond. I think we're up to around 15 people that have already said, yes, sign me up. And so it is just amazing to watch God continue to move in the lives of people here in our church. And so we're excited for just a really great weekend on the 26th and 27th. Uh, with that, I'm going to go ahead and pray for us, and we are going to um, sing a little bit more. I do want to mention one more thing, though. Uh, Matt Reed is going to preach this morning. If you'll remember, last week our church council introduced Matt Reed and is recommending Matt to our church. Matt is preaching in view of that call today. And so in talking with Matt over this past week, I know he is excited about the message that God has put on his heart. But let's be praying for Matt as he shares from God's Word this morning. I also mentioned there is a time, if you don't know Matt and Mary, we're going to have a, welcome, a meet and greet, a time for uh, you to just say hello to Matt and Mary over in the North venue at 1130 this morning. And so again, if you don't know them, just a great opportunity for you to kind of put a face with a name. They would love to meet you. And so that, again, that'll happen at 1130 right after our, our services are over. And then the last thing on that, next Sunday morning, we will be voting format. And so Jersey members, if you are registered, we are going to be voting in person for Matt next Sunday morning. And so again, members, if you have not registered, today is your last opportunity to do that. You can do that online. You can do it at the Next Steps area. All right. Well, with that, let's go ahead and stand back up. We are going to continue singing as part of our worship this morning. And then Matt is going to come and open up God's Word and share with us. Father, thank you for today. Father, we do thank you for this time that we have to worship you. Father, I'm so thankful for, for each and every person that has joined us here in the room, for everybody that's joined us online. Father, I pray now, uh, wherever we are, um, Father, I pray that, that whatever's happening in our lives, what, whatever is going on in our minds right now, Father, I pray that you would allow those things to just fall away. I pray that our focus would be on you. Father, thank you that you have us surrounded no matter what we do. And Father, I pray that our trust would be in you today. That is why we stand here. That is why we sing. And so, Father, we pray that it would be pleasing to you as we continue our worship. In Jesus' name. Church, 
So we just continue to posture our hearts. We focus on his goodness. We focus on his faithfulness.
We call you many things today, Father. Savior, hope of the world, Prince of Peace. Father, we magnify your name here today. Let you move through your word. Let you move through our worship. Move through our offering, Father. We thank you for all that you are today. It's in your son's name we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, I'm nervous. Are you? <laughs> when uh, Mark Richgree came in and told the staff, he uh, described it as, uh, on the 13th, Matt will preach the biggest sermon of his life. And uh, up to that point, I hadn't really thought about it. And then it hit me that, uh, yeah, I guess, that, I guess that's true. So, a lot of prayer, a lot of preparation. Uh, but go ahead and, and turn to 2 Kings chapter 6. And while you turn, uh, I want to tell you about John Wesley the 18th century English preacher. He wrote in his journal on May 24th, 1738, that there was a meeting he had been invited to in a local town, and he reluctantly went. And as he was there, the speaker was, was reading from a commentary on the book of Romans written by Martin Luther, uh, the great reformer. And, and uh, Charles Wesley had a response, which he wrote down in his journal. He said, while he was describing the change which God works in the heart through faith in Christ, I felt my heart strangely warmed. I felt I did trust in Christ, Christ alone for salvation, and an assurance was given me that he had taken away my sins, even mine, and saved me from the law of sin and death. Today we're gonna, we're gonna talk about a story where just like John Wesley's heart was warmed by the salvation of Jesus Christ, we're gonna talk about a man whose life reflected that warmth. And I pray if there's anybody here today that doesn't or has never experienced that warmth would experience it today. And so in 2 Kings chapter 6, verse 8, we're gonna read a story about a man named Elisha. Now, Elisha was a prophet. It's not Elijah, it's Elisha. Elisha came after Elijah, but he was the prophet that God used to guide Israel spiritually for this time in Israel's, in Israel's history. And he, he did speak through the prophet so that the prophet would give a future telling about some things. He would give a word about something that was going to happen. But he also worked through Elisha so that Elisha raised people from the dead healed people's bodies, multiplied food, even had an iron ax head float to the top of, a, of water. God worked mightily through Elisha and he's gonna be our main character. He's the one who's, whose life was strangely warmed by God so that he walked with God all the days of his life. On the, on the other side of the story is the enemy, the nation of Aram. And Aram is north and east of Israel modern-day Syria. And during this time, Aram was really a group of small kingdoms that were held together by, by similar culture and similar language. And their relationship with Israel was a roller coaster. In fact, in chapter 5, we see that their relationship was good enough that a general and the Aramean army felt comfortable enough to come to Israel to seek healing for a skin disease. But then in our chapter today and in the following chapters, we're going to see that Israel and Aram were at war a lot as well. And so when we, when we look at verse 8, that's where we're at. Aram and Israel's relationship is not good right now. In verse 8, it says, When the king of Aram was waging war against Israel, he conferred with his servants. My camp will be at such and such a place, but the man of God sent word to the king of Israel. Be careful passing by this place, for the Aramaeans are going down there. Consequently, the king of Israel sent word to the place the man of God had told them about. The man of God repeatedly warned the king so the king would be on his guard. So what was happening is the king of Aram was making a camp, really a military base. And he's saying, look, let's make a military base here so we can launch an attack into Israel. All right? and, and God then speaks to the man of God, who is Elisha, and says, Elisha, go to the king of Israel and tell them this is happening. So Elisha goes to the king of Israel and says, look, the Arameans are going to attack you here. And the king of Israel put the nation on guard in that area. 
So God, from the beginning, is protecting Israel through Elisha, right? God is going, look, my people are going to be attacked, so I'm going to give word to my prophet who will give the king a message so the king knows where to defend and where not to defend. And it's the point where... He does this regularly that the king of Israel is always on guard at the place he needs to be. Now, the other, the other thing I want you to notice is Elisha is described as a man of God. Three times, man of God. It's almost so repetitive, you just get tired of reading it in these three verses. And let me tell you, if there's a title I want on my life, it's to be a man of God. And it's a ti- if it's a title that you are seeking in your life, man of God, woman of God, that should be the one. I remember when I was in high school, I lost in a wrestling tournament and, and kind of as a selfish teenager, I was venting to my dad out of anger and frustration and you know, saying, well, I worked harder than this person. I worked harder than this person and they did better. And, and my dad kind of let me vent. And then eventually he goes, you know, Matt, but where's your heart? Where's your heart? And that was our language of, are you, are you, a, are you God's man? Or are you somebody else's man? Is your heart belong to God or not? He said, Matt, at the end of the day, wherever your heart belongs, that's the most important thing. No accomplishment, no accolade, no title is more important than your heart belonging to the Lord. And so if you're seeking something today, it's seek to be a man or a woman of God, like Elisha. So Elisha delivers the message, and he does this regularly. And then we see in verse 11 that obviously this would upset the king of Aram. Let's read verse 11. The king of Aram was enraged because of this matter, and he called his servants and demanded of them, tell me which one of us is for the king. So the king of Aram gathers the same servants he had gathered to form the military base in verse 8, and he gets them together, and he goes, which one of you all is a spy for Israel? Which one of you all is telling my plans to the king of Israel? Now, I find it fascinating. I wonder what it would have been like to have been there because do you think he was just expecting somebody to go, it's me, right? Like, like I'm the spy, right? That, it doesn't work that way. I mean, suspicion was high though. And I remember, I remember I, since I've been here, I've, I've been working mostly with our young adults and our kids and our youth, but I was at a wedding and there were some young adults all gathered around their phones and you think, well, that's not unusual, right? Yeah, but it doesn't matter. But they're all turned sideways and they were playing a game. And I watched them because they were talking with each other and they were laughing. So I walked over and I said, what game are you playing? I want to play. And I don't really play many games, but it looked fun. And so they helped me download the game Among Us. Joel Bagley, do you remember that? Joel helped me, Joel, Among Us. And it's a game where there's a group of people are in there and there's one bad guy trying to get rid of all the other guys. And he gets rid of one and then there's a vote and you try to vote off the right bad guy, right? And it's highly suspicious because when you're playing with all these people in the room, they're looking at each other going, it's him, no, it's him, no, it's him. And you have really no evidence, but you're thinking you do. And so it's all about suspicion. I never played this game before, but guess who won? Nobody ever suspects the pastor of being the bad guy, <laughs> right? But the, the king had this similar suspicion. He's going, which one of you all is a spy? Which one of you all is telling the king of Israel my plans? But the servants respond in verse 12. He says, one of his servants said, no one, my lord, the king, Elisha, the prophet in Israel, tells the king of Israel even the words you speak in your bedroom. So he goes, no, look, we aren't spies, but there's the prophet Elisha. Now, you notice he knew who he was. It wasn't like the king said, which one are you spies? Now go away and figure it out and come back and tell me. No, this is one meeting still. And he goes, which one of you is a spy? And he says, no, none of us. He's the spy, Elisha. He knows what you say, even in the most private of places. He knows your thoughts. He's the proverbial fly on the wall in every room that we can't do anything that he doesn't know about. And he's saying, look, and then he tells the king. So the king then, the king of Aram goes, all right, let's find out where this guy is. So in in verse 13 says, go and see where he is so I can send my men to capture him. But here's here's the interesting thing. When evil is thwarted, it always ups its game. When, when, when things in your life get hard, when the, when the evil one is trying to bring you down and the Lord defends you, evil always tries to up its game against you. The king of Aram couldn't beat Israel one way, so it was gonna try to beat Israel another way by killing their prophet. You know, what's interesting, again, evil is foolish because he goes, look, the prophet Elisha has thwarted all my military plans. 
well, I'm gonna solve this problem by making another military plan and sending an army after him. And you go, don't you think he'd see that coming, right? He saw all your other plans. But anyways, the king does it. He sends his army to get Elisha. But here's the thing. Let's just say, and he doesn't, but let's just say he does get Elisha. The king's not recognizing it's not Elisha that's doing this. It's God. See, evil is trying to bring you down. It doesn't recognize God's authority. It doesn't recognize that, that if you are a believer in Jesus Christ, greater is he who is in you than he who is in the world. Right, And so the king of Aram, he decides he's gonna go get Elisha. And so he's like, tell me where he is. In verse 13 at the end, it says that uh, when the king was told Elisha is in Dothan, he sent horses, chariots, and a massive army there. They went by night and they surrounded the city. So the king finds out where Elisha is. So he sends his army there. And, and just so you know, when it says horses and chariots, those are symbols, they're, they were, they're actually, there were horses and chariots, but they're also symbols of power, right? The horses, the, the cavalry was one of the, the most equipped units in the army, and the chariot was the ancient tank. You know, we hear a lot about tanks in the, the war between Ukraine and Russia, and, and trying to get more tanks to Ukraine and see if Russia has more tanks, you know, because there's this battle going on. Why? Because the tank is the most important weapon in modern battlefields. Right? And so the chariot was the most important weapon on ancient battlefields. So the fact that he sent this army with chariots and horses meant he sent a well-equipped professional army to go get Elisha. This isn't a group of volunteers. This is not a militia. This isn't some guys he found around the palace and he said, look, go get him. And this isn't a group of assassins either. This is a well-equipped army. And it says, it says in the CSB, massive army. But that word in the Hebrew for massive means heavy or weighty or even oppressive. He sent an oppressive army to go get Elisha. He wanted to put weight on Elisha. He wanted to lean on him. He wanted to push Elisha down with this army. And they, they go to Dotham and they surround the city by night. And then in verse 15, when the servant of the man of God, when the servant of Elisha got up early and went out, he discovered an army with horses and chariots surrounding the city. So he asked Elisha, oh, my master, what are we to do? So the servant gets up and he sees the army. He sees these ancient battle tanks and this, this, the cavalry that's surrounding the city. And, and he gets scared, rightfully so. And let's, let's pause for a moment and put this in perspective. This was something that was difficult for me. And so I wanna, I wanna try to draw a picture here for you. Unless we have some, some war veterans in here, some, some military veterans, which we are thankful for everybody who served in our military. But unless we have a, a lot of those in here who have been in combat, none of us, myself included, understand what it's like to have somebody seeking your life actively seeking your life, armed to seek your life. We just, we don't fully understand that. It's nobody's fault, it's just what it is. God has put us in a country where there is relative peace from warfare, and so that is a blessing for us. And, and, but, but on this occasion, somebody is armed and organized an army to take Elisha's life. Now, in America, right now, and I'm not belittling this, I'm just trying to create a parallel for us to understand. There is a nationwide mental health epidemic, which is real, which you know, people depressed and high anxiety, struggling and for a variety of different reasons. And, and, and many of them are serious. Many of them are very serious and people are, need to get help and they need to process through it. The reality is a lot of us though, don't have that and we don't have people coming after us. And so you take another step and you're like my wife and I, where a couple weeks ago, our greatest anxiety was we ended up at a bad hotel room. We went on vacation, just the two of us. We had booked a bed and breakfast and we got there and the guy gave us a tour. We were there maybe five minutes and he walked out of the room and I'm standing in the room, the door's closed. Mary looks at me, I look at her and she goes, are you okay with this? And the reality was, no, I wasn't, but there was no other rooms available anywhere. And we worked at it till like 10, 30, 11 o'clock at night and there were no rooms. And so you better believe we barricaded the door and we stayed together, right? And then the next night we found another room, right? And I know that's, that's really far on the, on the low anxiety, but, but in the sense of stress, that was a stressor for us, right? It is different than somebody trying to kill me, right? Would you agree with that? Are you sure? Because it is. I mean, that guy's, there's... 
on a 10 scale, Elijah's on 10, we were on one there, right? Okay, and then you got everything in the middle, right? The, the, the r- very real fear of losing a loved one, the very real fear of losing a job, the very real fear of financial struggles, right? Like, and and those, those are real, and I'm not, I'm not belittling those, but on the scale, again, my, my example being one, Elijah's 10, those are maybe at like a, a, a seven, right? Because you're not worried about your life being taken about people hating you so much they're gonna kill you. And so you can, we can all understand that the servant is a little bit discouraged, fearful, and anxious because these men have come to kill him and to kill his master. And so Elisha hears this in verse six, uh, 15, and then in, in verse 16, it says, um, Elisha said, don't be afraid for those who are with us outnumber those who are with them. See, I think this is what happened. I think the servant called down to Elisha to come up and see this. He walks up the steps to the wall and he looks over the wall. He puts his hands and he does this. He looks at the army. I think he kind of looked to see if it was on all sides. He said, all right. And he looked at the servant and he said, greater is the number with us than the number with them. And I think he started to walk down the steps back to his room, cool as a cucumber, unnervingly composed. And the servant, I think, is standing up there going, what are you saying? Well, how can you go back to bed? Like, how can you go back to your room? This army is going to kill us. And I think Elijah stopped halfway down the steps. And he turned around and he came back up. And as he's walking up, he's praying. In verse 17, he says, then Elisha prayed, Lord, open his eyes and let him see. So the Lord opened the servant's eyes and he saw that the mountain was covered with horses and chariots of fire all around Elisha. See, Elisha knew that the number with him was greater than the number against him. Notice the army of God is described as having horses and chariots just like the army of the Arameans, but there's a descriptor that's missed with the army of the Arameans. God's army is horses and chariots of fire. And how else do you explain an angelic army but one of fire? And notice the first time, grammar's important when you read the scriptures. Does anybody notice that mountain is singular, not plural? So when I read this, I imagined Dothan in the middle with Elijah in it, the enemy army encircling him, and then the, en- the army of the angels surrounding them. But it's not saying that. It says that the army of the angels, horses and chariots of fire, was covering the mountain, the mountain that Dothan was built on. So from the base of the mountain to the top of the mountain, Shoulder to shoulder, horse flank to horse flank, chariot wheel to chariot wheel. Every inch of the ground was covered with this angelic army. And guess who was at the middle of it? The mountain was covered with horses and chariots of fire all around Elisha. See, Elisha knew that if that army of the Arameans wanted to get to him, they had to go through God's army first. Psalm 46 Psalm 4, it starts out with verse 1. God is our refuge and strength, a helper who is always found in times of trouble. And that sets the tone for this psalm. But there's two other times at the end of kind of psalm choruses where it says, the Lord of armies is with us. The God of Jacob is our stronghold. The Lord of armies is with us. The God of Jacob is our stronghold. All armies are underneath God's army. He is the Lord of all armies. There is no army that can face him and win because he is ruler over all of them. And that same Psalm is the one that says, so be still and know that I am God. In the Christian standard Bible, which is this, it says, and stop your fighting and know that I am God. See, Elisha could be still and know that God is God because he knew God was the Lord of armies the Lord of armies that surrounded him. And so the servant sees this army and now he knows why Elisha is calm. But the Arameans don't see this army. 
So in verse 18, it says that when the Aramaeans came against him, Elisha prayed to the Lord, please strike this nation with blindness. So he struck them with blindness according to Elisha's word. Now, here's the thing. This is not blindness as in like you close your eyes and you can't see, everything's dark. This is more of a mental fog blindness because we're gonna see here that they can actually converse with Elisha and they can walk and move around and not run into things, all right? But the, the best example that I could give for this is really a real life example of a Jedi mind trick, all right? Anybody watch, anybody watch Star Wars movies? You heard of them? Just checking. And I'm not gonna get the numbers right, but the first one back in the 70s, right? Does anybody remember Obi-Wan Kenobi? These are not the droids you're looking for, right? And then the stormtrooper repeats to him, these are not the droids we're looking for, right? And he does that. Well, here we have that, where this army comes up to Dotham and Elisha hollers down. He says, this is not the way, and this is not the city. Follow me and I will take you to the man you're looking for. And he led them to Samaria. So I think, I think Elisha hollered down and said, this isn't the city you're looking for. And the commander of the army goes, hey guys, this isn't the city we're looking for. And then Elisha says, I'll take you to the right one. Guys, he's going to take us to the right one. And then they all follow him. I mean, that's the type of blindness God put upon this army. And then he took them to Samaria. Why is that significant? Samaria in this time, it, it, a lot of times we think Samaritans, which is like a region, the, the region of Samaria in the New Testament. This time Samaria was a town and it was the capital of the Northern kingdom of Israel. So after David and Solomon, the kingdom of Israel split and the South with Judah formed its own kingdom with its capital in Jerusalem. And the top, the top, the Northern tribes formed their own, they called it Israel and their capital was in Samaria. So. What's in Samaria? What's in your capital? Well, the king of Israel was in that capital and the standing army of the king of Israel was in the capital. So Elisha leads these guys, blinded as they are, into the capital. And at the end of verse 20, it says, when the Lord opened their eyes and they saw they were in the middle of Samaria, he literally led this enemy army into the middle of town. And when God removed their blindness, I think they opened their eyes and they saw the army of Israel encircling them probably spears drawn, shield to shield, ready to just kill them. And you gotta think these guys open their eyes and they go, oh, so I'm just gonna surrender, right? At this point, we can, we can fight, but we're gonna be killed. So everybody, all the airmans lay their arms down and the king of Israel comes out and he goes, Elisha, should I kill these men? And Elisha responds in verse 22, he says, don't kill them. Did you kill those you have captured with your sword or your bow? And in, in ancient uh, culture, in warfare, if you were the leader of the victors, you decided what happened to those you captured. Did you kill them? Did you release them? Did you enslave them? And what Elisha is telling the king of Israel here is like, you don't get to decide what happens to these men. You didn't capture them. God captured them. God won this victory. And so he decides what happens to them. And he wants you to have a feast. He says, set food and water in front of them so they can eat and drink and go back to their master. Why would you feed an enemy army? That language for eating and drinking together is the language of a treaty. God says, look, don't kill them, but instead form a treaty with them and then send them home. So that's what the king of Israel does. And at the end of verse 23, it says, then the Aramean raiders did not come into Israel's land again. At the beginning of this passage, God was defending his people and protecting them through Elisha. At the end, God is defending and protecting his people through a treaty because of a victory that he brought. This whole passage is about God defending and protecting and saving the nation of Israel and Elisha, the individual person. God is all about saving his people, protecting his people, both as a group and as individuals. So I would say everything in this passage boils down to this. When, the e when evil surrounds you, when evil surrounds you, trust that God will save you. When evil surrounds you, trust that God will save you. When evil tries to bring you down, when discouragement tries to bring you down, when the evil one just every day seems to be punching you in the face and trying to make you feel like you're nothing, trying to break down your identity in Christ, you can trust that God will save you, that God will meet you there because his army surrounds you every day. His army is with you all the time. And greater is he who is in you than he who is in the world. Nothing you face will be greater or stronger than God. And I think there's three things we can do to become like people 
that trust in God this way. And one, it's to be confident in the Lord. Be confident in the Lord. Be confident that God will save you. And that comes from taking steps of faith. When God says, look, I want you to do this, you go, okay, I do this. He says, I want you to do this, okay, you'll do this. And before you know it, you look in your past and you go, you see these steps of faith you've taken and how every time God meets you there. And that builds confidence. I remember when my wife and I were just out of seminary, we were looking for work. She was pregnant with our first child. And I got a job offer from my mentor. And it's the type of mentor where I told my wife, if I ever get a chance to work with him, man, I, I wanna work with Billy. Like it would be so good for me just to learn from him. Really godly man. And he offered, uh, it was a church planning position in Denver. And as Mary and I prayed about it, we realized that um, if we were gonna do that, we would be there for an extended period of time. And the Lord just didn't give us a comfortableness with that. So I had to call Billy and I had to tell him, hey, I, I don't think this is job for us. And I mean, I remember talking about with Mary going, if we say no to this, Mary, I still don't have a job and you're still pregnant. Right, like, like I'm looking at my life going, we're gonna have a baby and I don't have a job. And so of course I call Billy and Billy confirms it going, you know, Matt, after offering it to you, I've been praying about it and, and I agree. I don't think this is the spot for you. And I hang up the phone after, after being faithful to what God has spoken to us and having God confirm it through him. And I remember just crying, just looking at Mary going, what am I gonna do though? Like we've got all these things adding up and, and we, don't, we don't, how are we gonna pay rent? How are we gonna take care of the baby? What are we gonna do? Well, eventually I end up at a church and God made it clear that that church stay was gonna be very short. In fact, he spoke through Mary to me that we were gonna have a transition. And uh, after we'd been there about two years, God said, you're gonna transition. Pastor John called me to be the next gen minister at this church the following week. And if we would have taken that job in Denver, I'd still be in Denver. But I look at how God has met me along the way to the point of standing before you. And he has been faithful every time. And that's why I can be confident that God will be there for you as well. He's never let me down. He's never let me down. It didn't matter what happened in my life. He has always been there. And that's the one thing I stand before you and can promise you, he's always been there. I think something else we see in Elisha in this passage is he prays. Three times he prays for the servant's eyes to be open, for the enemy to be blind, and then for the enemy's eyes to be open. Prayer is important because prayer is acknowledging that you can't do something, but God can. It's humbling. And James 4, 6 says, God resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble. When we turn to the Lord in prayer and we say, Lord, we can't do this, but you can. That's when God rises up and meets us there. Because God's like, you're right, I'll answer that prayer. And he answered every one of Elisha's prayer. Elisha took faithful steps to follow the Lord. Elisha humbled himself in prayer. And the Lord met him there and, and had a great victory for his people. When evil surrounds you, trust the Lord will save you. When evil surrounds you, trust the Lord will save you. So let's be a church that is confident in our Lord because we're being faithful to him. And let's be a church that humbles ourselves in prayer before the Lord. And some of you are sitting here today and you're going, that all sounds well and good, Matt, but you don't know my life. You don't know what's happened to me. You don't know what's happening to me now. I don't. I'm not Elisha. God's not spoken a word of the future to me. But what I can tell you and what I can firmly say, no matter where I'm at in life, this has always been true. Whatever you face, God can free you from. Whatever you face, God can give you peace in the midst of. Whatever you face, God will rescue you from, but you have to turn to him. You cannot do it on your own. So whether you've been a Christian for a week, whether you've been a Christian for a year, whether you've been a Christian all your life, the same is true. No matter what you face, you've got to turn to him because he will save you. So if you're, if you're feeling broken today, if you're feeling lost, if you're feeling like nobody cares, turn to the Lord, turn to Jesus, because Jesus loved you enough to give his life for you. Jesus loved you enough to be tortured for you. He died and then he was raised that you can have eternal life, but God will not force it upon you. God won't force it upon you. He waits for you to make the decision and you can make that decision today. The decision to find freedom 
and the decision to find peace in the midst of chaos in your life. Don't leave here today if you've got those things going on. Because what we're gonna do is when, when I'm done here, I'm gonna pray, we're gonna stand, we're gonna sing, and we're gonna have people down front that would love to help you understand what it means to have peace and freedom in Jesus Christ. And it'll be the best decision you've ever made because no matter where I've been, when things were bad and where things were good, when things seemed awful and you didn't think they could get worse and then they did, God is there. And his army surrounds you and his army is watching over you and he's protecting you and he won't let anything break through that you can't handle. And you'll find peace and you'll find freedom there. And, and in the end, it'll be joy. Don't leave here today without placing your faith and trust in Jesus Christ and feeling what John Wesley did about your heart being strangely warmed. Let's pray. Lord, I, I know I'm not an Elisha, but I know that you are the same God who spoke to Elisha that speaks to us today. The same God that sent the army of angels is the same God that watches over us today. So Lord, Watch over us as a group, as Jersey Church. Help us to trust in you no matter what we face, both, Lord, in prayer and in faithfulness, and, Lord, as individuals as well. And, God, if there is somebody here today who does not know you, if there is somebody here today that is struggling, Lord, pull their heart to you so they would, they would know that you are the way out. You are the safe route. You are the one who rescues them. Give them peace and joy and freedom today. And we pray this in Jesus Christ, amen. So why don't we stand? Well, amen this morning. And as uh, again, you um, listen to that, that message that Matt preached as you listen to the prayer that he prayed there at the end. And may, maybe that, <laughs> that person that he was talking about and praying about is you. Maybe you are struggling today. Maybe, maybe you're not exactly sure what your next step is. Maybe you feel like, uh, instead of God's army surrounding you, you feel like the enemy has you surrounded. But as Matt encouraged us through this message, we, we know that if we would just open our eyes, allow God just to really open our spiritual eyes to know that he has us surrounded. I can tell you in our central venue right now, as they're closing in just a, a, a song, that's what they're singing about, the fact that God has them surrounded. He has you surrounded today. And so my encouragement to you would be this. If you want someone just to come alongside you and pray with you, maybe pray for you, let us know that. You, you can text us, you can email us. If you'll do that, just let us know a little bit about what's going on and how you want us to pray for you, then we would love really more than anything to be able to come alongside you and do that. So if you'll text or email us, we will reach back out to you and give you a call and set up a time to talk and where we can um, do that, answer any questions you might have and then spend some time praying for you. Well, thank you so much for joining us today. It's been a great morning of worship. Already looking forward to next week. Have a great, great week.